welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm David, and in this episode we're going to be upgrading a car's navigation unit with a Raspberry Pi. Let me pull in somewhere safe and I'll talk you through the project. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Okay, modern cars have often got ways of stopping you using your mobile phone while you're driving, but also still providing a lot of the conveniences. This car, for example, has got no sat-nav built in. However, you connect a decent new phone, and there you go. You can use the screen in the car with a limited access to notifications and apps and music on your phone while being less distracted while you're driving. So you get a lot of driver convenience without the distractions access to music, podcasts. I like it. It works well for me and how I like to use my car and my phone safely while I'm driving. This, by contrast, is a 2012 Ford Focus, which has got this lovely head unit, which is not bad by any stretch but you can immediately see the limitations. It's got Bluetooth, you can make phone calls on it, you can listen to music using the A2DB, Audio 2 something something protocol on Bluetooth, but it kind of is limited there. Now, there are upgraded head units. I think Ford made the Sync model for this, which had a nice big screen there and a climate control and all sorts. But if you don't have the wiring harness and all the sensors required to make that work, including a GPS antenna, you can't use the full functionality. And also, that's still an older head unit that doesn't come with Android Auto. So I was wondering, as you do, could I add one? Well, in theory, yes. Let's get back inside and start playing on the workbench, see what we can come up with. The good news is the core of this project is really simple. Grab an SD card, Download the latest image of Crankshaft NG, flash it onto your SD card, grab yourself a Raspberry Pi, compatible touchscreen, stick your SD card in, attach the two and power on. Obviously the final hardware arrangements is going to change by preference, by phone, by car, by whatever bells and whistles you'd like to add to this, but that's enough to at least get you started. Now this is the Raspberry Pi official 7 inch screen and this is a Farnell 10 inch or 10.1 inch touch screen. This has got a Raspberry Pi 4 behind it and this has got a 3V Plus behind it. Both of which will work absolutely fine. It's just down to preference. I'm going to lean towards the 10 inch display for a couple of reasons. First of all, 10 inch is better than 7, no? But also power. As you can see, powering the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus and the screen is not trivial. Bearing in mind you're in a car, you're going to have to be doing this off of 12 volts using one of those little cigarette lighter inserts that bring it down to 5 volts, hoping that you've got enough to run this over USB. I mean, I'm running this off a bench power supply, slightly tweaked up to 5.1 volts, and during boot, the 3B Plus will hit 1.5 amps. It's not a trivial power draw. However, the 10 inch screen just takes 12 volts in, steps it down and provides a high current throughput to the Raspberry Pi at 5 volts. So all I have to worry about is giving this 12 volts. Now if you didn't know, cigarette lighter inserts in cars, or 12 volt outputs if I'm sure they're politically correct called now, can allegedly pull up to 120 watts at to 10 amps at uh, 12 volts. That's plenty to run this project. So that's half the reason I'm gonna be using the 10 inch screen. So this now works exactly the same as it did in the car. I've got a touch screen, I've got access to notifications. Exciting, take the rubbish out. Uh, I've got access to podcasts and other media. I can even use Google Assistant. So I'm gonna be connecting audio using Bluetooth in my car, but if you don't have Bluetooth, you can use an auxiliary input. If you don't have an auxiliary input, you can use an FM transmitter. If you don't have an FM transmitter, you can use one of those cassette plug-in things, which incidentally I think are magic and a way better quality than they have a right to be. 
but you can make this project work in virtually any car. One thing I will say, if you're using the analog output of the Raspberry Pi for audio using an auxiliary in or an FM transmitter or a cassette adapter, you probably want to look into a, a new sound card or DAC out for the Raspberry Pi because the built-in sound is, is not so great. So to round this project out into an actual decent custom project, I will be sorting out the car power so I've got a cigarette lighter adapter and some power jacks, but very importantly, this is fused. Don't forget that you don't want all of the 10 amps from your car going through whatever cable you get. You need to select a fuse that is appropriate to your car. And the aim of this project is to not modify the car any more than something that is removable. Otherwise you have to get your insurers involved and nobody wants that. So we're gonna make a PCB to hold some external interfaces. We've got a real time clock to make sure the time is always up to date. I wanna get fancy, add some LEDs for power and indication and a capacitive touch button to turn this on and off because it will time out and go to sleep if you don't plug a phone in. I don't want to have to stop, turn the car off and turn it back on again to get it back to life. Um, I found a five volt fan I had floating around. Can't even remember where it came from, but that's going to do wonders with a couple of little heat sinks to keep the Raspberry Pi 4 warm. I don't think in this application it should get too bad, but with the sun beating down through a windscreen, it's possible. And finally, we'll 3D print a case for it. Theory goes, that should be a nice little 12 volt lead we can use to power up the screen of the Raspberry Pi on the 10 inch screen. With the core of the project kind of understood, we can now start thinking about how we're actually going to build this thing. Now, to start with, we've got to think about how we're going to mount it, in particular, how it's angled, because whether you realize this or not, things that are mounted in your car typically only come in one of two ways. And they normally have a cowl over the top so you don't get any sh sun directly shining on them but they're often either pitched forward like that pointing at the, so the reflections pointing at the ceiling or pointed downwards now obviously this one we want slightly pointed upwards and in terms of its position i kind of want it so that none of the view from the windscreen in my line of sight when i'm driving is going to be obstructed that's super important because we're trying to make driving safer not less safe so I've got hold of some metal work and some brackets and I'm hoping some combination of these is going to work for getting this mounted on the dashboard. Also I want to take this board off because I think I'm going to have much more depth to be able to mount the board parallel or perpendicular to the thing and so sort of the Raspberry Pi and the control board for them screen sort of stick into that hole in the dashboard where the existing screen is so let's see what hardware we can make work yeah what are the chances so I was kind of thinking some kind of F bracket so in profile maybe that and that so that the existing bit of the dashboard goes in there and I can clamp onto it and all the electronics can sit here well if the holes tie up on here that means they should tie up on there as well That'd be amazing. Okay, well, in theory, if I mount that on there, come on, job done. That's worked way better than I expected. So there you go, we've now got the Pi and the screen driver mounted perpendicular to the screen. Uh, and that gives me depth under here that I can sort of lose in, in the console. Do you like winning free stuff? Are you an electronics hobbyist? Do you like building cool projects and winning prizes for what you build? The Element 14 community presents Project 14, the member-driven destination where you decide on the challenge. You enter projects to win monthly prizes and you vote on the winners. What are you waiting for? Join the Element 14 community so you too can enter one of our contests or submit an idea for your own. Join now! 
Right, to make this work, I want these things plugging into the Raspberry Pi GPIO. This really handy little board actually demonstrates the pinout. Now, this real-time clock module is actually designed so it would fit straight over the first six pins, taking 3 volt, 5 volt, GPI 1, 2, and ground pins, which would sit like that. The trouble is, GPI 03 has a special purpose, which I want to make use of. If you short that down to ground, so in theory those two pins together, a Pi that's in standby or idle mode will boot. So if you've done shut down your Raspberry Pi, pseudo shut down, then waited for it to shut down, you know it still has that power LED on it? Well, wait for that state, then short these two pins, the Raspberry Pi will boot again. So I want to be able to use that. But by default, GPIO3 is used for the I2C interface, which means we need to remap the I2C interface and the pins that this needs somewhere else on the GPIO. Putting a tack switch between ground and GPIO3 would allow you to use a tack switch as normal GPIO when it's booted, but also uh, you could do the, the soft reboot with it. But for some reason, I'm feeling unnecessarily complicated, so rather than using a tactile switch, I'm using a TTP223 module, which is this lovely little capacitive sensor. Now it's got a little bit of configuration. You see these points here, A and B? You can bridge those to change whether it's a toggle switch or a momentary switch, and you can change whether it goes high or goes low when proximity capacitance is made. So using that with a transistor, we can actually pull GPIO3 down to ground, which is not too hard. We've got an LED that I'd like to light up and we'll have to use another transistor off a 5 volt rail to get this fan going because I don't want to run that straight off GPIO, it won't run fast enough or hot enough, but we'll also run that through a transistor on GPIO so that we can actually run this fan only when it's hot. Okay, so soldering up is finished. We've got the GPIO header for the Raspberry Pi down in this corner. You've got three pins here which will take power. That five volt supply generated by the screen will actually come in here. That supplies the Raspberry Pi, but it also supplies directly the fan. But that's switched through a transistor over here from GPIO. You've got an output uh, LED, which will be controlled by GPIO. You then got this little capacitive touch sensor board, which is wired to the 3.3 volt supply on the Raspberry Pi. All the time, five volts is supplied to the Pi. Even if it's in sleep, that 3.3 volts is there. Meaning we can use this to bring through the transistor, switch the ground to GPIO3 and bring the Pi out of sleep. We've also brought two GPIO pins, five volts and ground across to this little six pin header over in the corner. So the real-time clock module can be here with a soft I2C bus mapped to it. And with that all assembled, it can go onto the GPIO header of the pipe, ready to work. Well, welcome to the coding cave. Uh, I thought this was a good time to start thinking about some 3D printing that's going to be done to sort of encapsulate some of the more exposed parts. And uh, also we'll talk about the software and how to get this thing booted up for the first time. So I've built a model in Fusion 360 which basically shows you the screen, the brackets, and I've just blanked out a space for the Raspberry Pi and the screen controller. Uh, just to give me an idea of what needs covering up. Now actually most of this is not too bad because Obviously the screen is facing forward. You've got the dashboard that sort of slots in here at some weird compound angles, which are gonna be a nightmare to cover. So actually the only thing I really wanna cover up is kind of the back of the screen. And then having a separate item, which will just be a big sort of flat sheet with a couple of curves over it to cover the metal brackets over the dashboard. So it's gonna be kind of simple. So there you go, there's our first part. And I kind of wanted to leave the edge of the glass exposed because from the side, you shouldn't see much, if any, of the backing. And it gives that illusion of, well, being slimmer than it is, quite frankly. 
So from the edges, you're going to notice the edge of the glass way before you see the plastic that's going to be 3D printed. Now there is one other feature I'd quite like to get printed up, which is definitely going to get seen and is quite important. So we should definitely model that next. And that is the button, the power button. So remember I said that this is, um, it's got a, a power off timer. So after a while of not having a phone plugged in or, or no touch interactions, the whole system will shut down. Now that's up to an hour, but depending on how your car leaves its power outlets on when it's parked, depending on whether you might want to make that shorter so the Pi goes into a low power mode. So I wanted this power button. So if it shuts off in the first five minutes, say I've set the timer to five minutes, then I can reboot the Pi without having to unplug it or plug it back in or anything like that. Um, and that's what the point of the capacitive sen touch sensor is for. Uh, and also the LED, so it's going to have a nice backlight to it to indicate power or screen off. And I want that to sort of protrude from the bottom of the screen down here, but in quite an organic curved kind of thing. Excellent, so it's going to be from here, seamless to the glass. But we're also going to have something to sort of, or probably something really non-offensive in this, like maybe double-sided tape to hold this on. Don't want to risk messing up the capacitive sensing of the screen by like gluing something to the glass. Here you go. We have a hole through our object that the LED backlight can shine through. Hopefully, it might be a bit of play to get that looking great. Okay, the software on this seems really daunting. It's not as bad as it seems, even if getting the software i2c is a bit challenging i will include all of the files and code and sample that over on the element 14 community so rather than trying to copy from me or listen to what i'm saying which i'm guessing is painful you can go download copies over there Well, there it is. That is the finished article. And I've got to say, I like it. I think it's worked really well for the space. I can still get clear sight, a line of sight over the bonnet and it works. And in case you were wondering, that button, which looks good with the LED, it's like one of my favorite parts of the project. As it turned out, it's worked really well. And not only does it shut it down to that low power sleep mode, but if you press it, even when the Raspberry Pi is off, it will boot back on. Granted, it takes a minute. So let's plug a phone in and give it a test spin. Uh, because the Earwolf message boards are now dead. Uh, we will see you next week on a mini episode of... So with Android Auto running, if you up the DPI on a suitable screen high above uh, 100 uh, DPI, then you get the nice split screen mode, which you don't get in most cars. But I think it looks good, it works well, so let's take it for a drive. For me, this project has worked out really well. I think it fits in with the car nicely. If I was looking to make any updates, I think I would look down the route of CAN bus interfacing with the Raspberry Pi plugged into the ODB2 port of the car to get more input and more integration. But that involves a whole load of extra learning on my part. I hope you've enjoyed this project. Let us know over on the Element 14 community if you try and make a similar unit at element14.com forward slash presents. Don't forget to head over there to find project files, code, and 3D printing files. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you next time. There is one part of this project I've been waiting to do for ages. You know when you're looking for an outside location to film in? Bah! <laughs>